record on this. Okay. Oh, that's new. Did you just hear this <laughs> meeting is being recorded? Must be a legal, <laughs> legal thing. All right. We have our garden tour coming up on June 6th, and those tickets are going fast. So if you haven't gotten yours yet, I highly suggest that you do. Um, we're doing guided, excuse me, guided tours of the old burying grounds. Uh, one every month and those tickets are available on our website and we're working on another antiques event. So lots going on. Please visit our website for more information. And as I said, I will send that information over to you in the email. Oh, Janet says she got her tickets. Garden Tour is fantastic. Thank you, Janet. It should be a beautiful day. All right. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speaker. He probably needs no introduction at this point, but I'll do it just in case. Um, oh, thank you for changing the slide. Uh, thank you to our sponsor. Thank you, Robert, for prompting me. Thank you to our sponsors for this event and all of our virtual lunch and learns, People's United Bank. They have been wonderful sponsors of our in-person lunch and learn as well as our virtual. And we hope to maybe get some in-person lunch and learns in the fall. We'll see how it goes. But I would be curious if you'll put in the chat, would you be interested in continuing virtual lunch and learns? Do you prefer in person? Let me know your feedback on that. I'd love to hear it. Um, and thank you to everyone who made a donation when they signed up and to everyone who is a member. Membership starts at $40 for an individual and it supports all the work of the society and you get discounts on things like the garden tour tickets and, and most of our events. So I hope you'll look into that if you are not already a member. <laughs> All right, now without further ado, I'm gonna introduce our speaker. Robert Hughes uh, is the town historian. He is appointed by the town supervisor to coordinate the town's historic pres preservation efforts manage the town's historic properties, and serve as liaison to cultural and historical organizations within the town. The historian is secretary to and administrative officer of Huntington's Historic Preservation Commission. And he works very closely with the Huntington Historical Society and with all of the museums and cultural institutions in Huntington to, to help with preservation and, and other historical things. So without, further ado, which I've said already, I'm going to turn it over to our speaker, Robert. Thank you, Robert, for joining us. Uh, thank you, Tracy. Um, I, I think this is going to be an interesting discussion that I hope we'll have a lot of back and forth um, because uh, we're trying to cover things that are going on now in the town of Huntington and questions always come up and I am often asked what's new and I always have to say nothing's new because I'm a historian. <laughs> But we do have recent topics um, that have been in the newspapers and getting some attention. And I just wanted to make sure that everyone is fully familiar with where uh, the genesis of those uh, issues and where they stand today. It's sometimes hard to keep everyone up to date uh, on these various topics. And of course, um, as I said, I'm anticipating lots of questions. And unlike uh, our usual format where we take questions at the end, this is broken down into several sections. So I think after each section, I'll stop uh, and see if there are any questions about that topic um, before we go forward. The first thing I want to talk about is, is very timely. It's a very new issue, uh, the Samus Street Historic District, which does not yet exist, um, but uh, it hopefully will soon. Um, Samus Street, uh, as most people probably uh, know, is one of the east-west streets southeast of the Huntington Village uh, Business District, runs from New York Avenue to Nassau Avenue. Uh, it was designated for its concrete roadway and sycamore trees by the town board in 2003 as a historic roadway. And that designation did not cover the houses, only the roadbed, uh, which the, the residents there wanted to keep cement. They didn't want it to be uh, paved over with asphalt. And it's one of only a handful of uh, such streets in the town of Huntington. Uh, a couple of years ago, a developer purchased this property, which is on the corner of Samus Street and Myrtle Avenue. And uh, he wants to uh, demolish the house, subdivide the property, which is uh, actually a double lot from the original subdivision in the early 20th century, uh, and create three new houses on this property. 
the, uh, the neighbors were very upset uh, about losing a historic house and also the prospect of having three new properties um, in, their, in their neighborhood. Uh, so the, um, that sort of opposition to this project came about this year in 2021. The Historic Preservation Commission first looked at this property in 2019. And at that time, we thought that the house itself should be saved if possible, but if the builder wanted to build a new house behind it, that would be acceptable. However, we could not, uh, when the builder didn't want to keep the house and was moving forward with a three lot subdivision, the Preservation Commission determined that the house itself did not meet the criteria for landmark designation um, as a standalone entity. But if it were part of a larger historic district, um, it would be a contributing structure to that historic district. And this is a case of, of the whole being greater than the sum of the parts. Each house individually may not qualify, but uh, overall uh, they would create uh, part of the historic character of, uh, of this neighborhood and of Huntington Village and the town of Huntington overall. And the petition to support uh, historic designation of this district has garnered uh, signatures from throughout the town. But mostly, of course, the people who are uh, most important in determining whether to create a historic district are the property owners of Salmon Street. The town code requires that if you want to petition the town board to create a historic district, you need 30% of the property owners to sign a petition. In this case, 70% of the property owners signed a petition. So there's overwhelming support. The uh, area, just to go back to some of the history, was subdivided by uh, the Samus family. It originally was part of the Samus farm of Frederick G. Samus. Uh, when he passed away, it was inherited by his sons, George A. and Frederick B. Samus. And they were started to sell off uh, houses, uh, mostly uh, along Fairview Street and then Dewey Street and then moving south. And this is a subdivision map that they filed in 1918. Uh, and you can see that they've divided the farm up into individual lots that are 150 feet deep by 50 feet wide, which is noteworthy because current zoning for this area, the R5 zone, permits lots that are 100 feet deep and 50 feet wide. So these lots are 50% larger than the zoning would allow. There's a wonderful quote in the papers from 1900 where George Samus talks about one of the most important crops a farmer can grow are cottages with uh, desirable owners. Uh, it was quoted in Newsday, I think it was yesterday. Um, and uh, I used it in a report that I will talk about in a minute. Um, there's also talk about uh, beyond just the Samus Street Historic District, creating a district that runs from Grandview, which is at the bottom of this map, up to uh, Fairview and maybe beyond to East Carver Street. There currently is a small historic district on East Carver Street that runs from Myrtle uh, up to Nassau Road. So this is, there's an, an attempt to now create, to preserve uh, this neighborhood, which really most of these houses, all the houses on Salmon Street except one were built before 1930, from about 1910, mostly in the 1920s through 1930. And we have been lucky that the historic character of this neighborhood has been preserved. Uh, you know, over the years, these neighborhoods, these older neighborhoods close to town, suffered some decline as the subdivisions were built further out, and those were the more desirable, newer houses to live. But in the last 20, 30 years, this neighborhood has been rediscovered. And we've been very lucky that these uh, historic houses have been preserved. Um, and these are the, all the houses on uh, Salmon Street. Uh, but now, rather than relying on luck, the, the, the residents, or the property owners, which some of these are rentals, so it's more the property owners who have a say, uh, would like to make sure we have the force of law behind preserving these structures. And historic designation uh, is something that is um, done on the local level, on the village or town level. And it's important to keep in mind that uh, designation means different things in different places. So there are some places that could be very, very strict and might control what colors you can paint the outside of your house. They might give you a palette of historic colors and said, you have to pick one of these to paint. And other places could be you know, very loose with their restrictions and it's almost anything goes. 
In Huntington, we try to take a middle ground, be more reasonable. We want to preserve the historic fabric and historic character of these buildings and of the neighborhood, but we want to make it, uh, we don't want to make it unduly burdensome to live in these houses and to maintain these houses. Houses historically change and grow as people's fam as their families change and grow, um, their needs change, um, and, and we want to try to accommodate that. And in fact, many of these houses on Salmon Street have had additions built, mostly uh, to the back of the building, but some in the front, and they, they don't look uh, quite the way they once did. But now that there will be a historic district, hopefully, um, the plan is that uh, first, buildings cannot be demolished unless it's an economic hardship, and these buildings are generally in very good condition, so that's not something that uh, should arise. And if people want to make changes, we will guide them to make sure that the changes they make are consistent with the historic character of the building and the street. Uh, the process now at this point, uh, the petition was submitted. The Historic Preservation Commission had a meeting this past Monday night uh, to consider it, to hear from the property owners, to see what they thought about it. And they determined, the Preservation Commission determined that the uh, proposed district did meet the criteria of the town code. And therefore they recommended that the town board create a historic district here. Um, the town board now has the option of scheduling a public hearing uh, where people can be heard again. And if uh, then there's a, after the public hearing, the town board has 90 days to determine whether or not to create this historic district. And I can't imagine they would not uh, go along with the, the property owner's wishes, that the property owners want this. And so far, no one has objected. No one has said this is going to be an economic hardship. No one has said they don't want to go through a review process for their houses. So I can't imagine the town board would not create the historic district. So that may be in place by later this year. Uh, as we're looking at these pictures, I should point out most of these houses are uh, colonial revival, including several uh, Dutch colonials or craftsman style bungalows. Uh, which were popular styles uh, in the 1920s. The one house here at 39 Samus Street is a Greek revival, and that is already an individually designated historic site. So it's already protected uh, under the town code. And that is probably one of the best uh, examples of Greek revival uh, architecture in the town of Huntington. So before we get to the Crippen House, uh, are there any questions in the chat um, about the Samus Street Historic District or uh, you know, the background of that property uh, or what the ramifications of being in a historic district would be. No questions yet. We'll give it 30 okay. seconds or so to let people. We can go on. You can always come back later on in the presentation. That's, that's not an issue. Uh, another uh, project that's been in the news, it's not necessarily a historic preservation commission issue, uh, is the Peter Crippen House which is on Creek Road and Hale site, uh, right next to the sewage treatment plant. Uh, and it has an interesting background. This is a, a picture of the house, an aerial view from 1959. Uh, if you're familiar with the house uh, in its current condition, which I'll show you some pictures later, uh, this looks far, far better than it does today. But it still, as you can see, is right next to the sewage treatment plant, which is, which is not a great place to live. Um, the background of this house is that it is believed to have been the first mill building from the town of Huntington built in 1657. The mill was on Mill Lane, what is now Mill Lane, and a small stream that feeds from uh, south in the village um, moved up to, um, <clears throat> the flowed up to, or down, I should say, to Huntington Harbor. And a dam was built to impound that stream uh, to power the mill. Unfortunately, the, the thought was that the pond presented a public health hazard and the uh, mill was discontinued and a new mill was built in Centerport. So the, the old mill building was at some point after 1672 moved up to Creek Road and converted into a residence. Um, and it, it was occupied by various families for the next 200 years and became a bit more noteworthy uh, for us in 1864 when it was purchased by Peter Crippen, who was an African-American from uh, Virginia. 
And uh, at the time we uh, first started looking into this house in 2006, we thought it was the first property purchased by an African-American in the town of Huntington. It turns out that we've discovered an earlier property that was purchased by uh, Benjamin Hammond um, in, uh, six, in the 1790s. So this was certainly an early uh, African-American purchase, but not the first. In fact, his neighbor, Nelson Smith, had purchased land uh, just to the south of this house in uh, 1854. So Peter Crippen uh, lived here until he died in 1875. His family uh, continued to live here. His, his children inherited it. They built the larger uh, portion of the house that you see here, the two-story portion. I'll show you the one-story portion where Peter Crippen lived a little later on. And the house moved uh, from generation to generation within the Crippen family informally um, until uh, 2000 or 2001, uh, when his great-great-grandson, uh, Raymond Carmen, passed away. And he lived in this house until 20 years ago, which some people find very hard to believe. Uh, the property, uh, we've talked to Kip Carmen, Raymond's son, about uh, you know, what the house was like and the property was like. And it was a little mini farm. They raised pigs as remains of a pigsty in the back corner. They had vegetables, they had fruit trees, they grew vet, um, they raised chickens. Uh, so it was, you know, quite the production on a very small piece of land. Um, so here's that larger picture that you can see more in context. The house is down here in the front corner. I should have put these pictures in the reverse order. This is the house in 2006, which is uh, when I first started to get involved in looking into the house. And unfortunately, these are not color photographs because this is pre-digital and I can't find the original prints. And all I have is the Xerox copy. Uh, but I'm glad I have these because uh, the house looks far different today. Um, it's actually the notice of the importance of this house was first taken in the eight, uh, 1980s, 1985. Rufus Langens, who was then town historian, recommended that this house be moved from this property because it was right next to the sewage treatment plant. But of course it was still privately owned, so there's nothing the town could do uh, about moving it. In 2006, we had um, a proposal to not only uh, do an archeological study of the property, but also a structural analysis of the building, take measured drawings uh, and, and determine what we could do with this house uh, at some future date but the property was still owned by uh, the Crippen family descendants. Uh, and because it had been passed down informally from generation to generation, it was unclear who was in a position to give us full authority to do that work on private property. So the town attorney said, we have to wait until the title issue is really clarified. And that took a number of years. And in the meantime, uh, this is the result. Uh, you know, in all those years, the house kind of deteriorated further and further and further. Nonetheless, it did survive uh, hurricanes, including Superstorm Sandy and Nor'easters and all sorts of other things. And the part we are most interested in, this is a, another picture before it fell apart. The part we're most interested in is this one and a half story section. This is the original mill building from 1657. And as you can see, it's, it's stayed more or less intact, unlike the other uh, wing of the house but it is sinking into the mud. So the windowsills are now below ground level, uh, which is unfortunate and presents challenges. People ask, why did the town let this happen? Why did the town let it get to this condition? There's really not much the town could have done because the town did not own the house until 2019. The property was purchased actually on behalf of the sewer district for future expansion uh, and now immediately for parking, but perhaps for future expansion of the sewer plant. So it wasn't until 2019 that town was in any position to do anything with this property. And uh, there were plans were announced to demolish it, to make way for that parking lot. Uh, and that really got people's attention. People understood the background of this property, the importance to the African-American community. I, I should mention that Peter Crippen was one of the founders of Bethel AME Church. Uh, the first African-American church in town uh, and was, you know, a very well-respected uh, member of the community. Um, so people were upset that the town was just going to demolish his house. And as a result of, of letters, emails, uh, an online petition that garnered well over a thousand signatures, the town put a temporary hold, now an indefinite hold, on demolition uh, of this property. 
Uh, and that allowed us time to start an archeological study. Uh, it allowed us time to peel back some of the later siding that you see here. There are at least two or three layers of siding above the original white clapboard, uh, which I was able to expose. So it looks a little bit more uh, historic uh, now than it did before. So we did a phase one archeological study, which was paid for by a donation from the Manus Peace Prize Foundation. And the archeologists uh, uncovered um, 513 artifacts. And these are a few of them. Um, and these are, the phase one archeological study involves digging test pits every uh, 20, 25 feet on the property uh, to see what's there, to see if it has the potential for uh, greater archeological discoveries. And it turns out that it does meet the criteria set forth by the archeological uh, community for a further study. So uh, the recommendation is that we do a, a phase two study, which involves digging larger uh, pits uh, in the areas that showed the most promise. Unfortunately, that uh, project is a $30,000 project. We've already secured a $5,000 donation, but need to raise the other $25,000 uh, for that to be a reality. At the same time, uh, we applied for a grant from the Preservation League of New York State to fund a structural analysis of the building to see if and how it can be relocated to another site. Um, uh, that uh, grant was matched by town funds of $3,500. The engineers have been, and a con uh, conservator have been out on the site uh, studying it, and I'm awaiting their report any day now. Um, preliminary indications are that it will be a very expensive proposition uh, because the house needs to be shored up uh, in order to be lifted and moved. And there's no guarantee that it even can be because it's been uh, sinking into the mud for so long. The other option is to dismantle the house. Since it's a timber frame structure, that is something that is done all the time. For example, the barn at the uh, Kassam house and also the barn at the Conklin house were on other sites originally, were dismantled. Um, all the uh, timbers were labeled and numbered uh, and then reassembled on their new locations. So that is something we may be able to do. And we have selected a site and I did not include the uh, preliminary conceptual site plan, but there's a site that we know as the Naval Reserve site on the south west corner of uh, Mill Dam Road and New York Avenue, uh, which is across from the American Legion Hall. It's uh, by the uh, Northern Roundabout on New York Avenue. And it right now is about a two acre site with nothing on it. It's uh, open land hidden behind uh, a hedge of, of uh, wild trees. And it would be a wonderful place to put this uh, building, not only where it's more visible, but also where it retains to some extent its original context, because it's just a couple of hundred yards from its existing, lo existing location. And that's important with historic preservation. You don't want to move a building too far from where it had been, because then it loses the context. And, and this is a waterfront dwelling. It was a waterfront industrial building, so it should be near the waterfront. So that's what we're hoping will happen. We have to see what the price tag is on uh, salvaging and, remove, and moving the structure and see if we can handle that. Uh, and then it becomes you know, a question for the town board to allocate those fundings or for uh, donations uh, and uh, foundation grants uh, to be secured to make that a possibility. Uh, and one of the things we're gonna do is uh, place a historical marker on the site of where the house was uh, this is uh, just delivered uh, this week, and so you can see, see it still has some of its packaging on there, but I wanted to take a picture for, uh, for people to see. And uh, because of COVID, the, the foundry was a little backed up, so we, we hoped to put this up last year, and uh, instead it's going to go a year later. So when you see erected 2020, you all know that it was really 2021. Uh, I don't know if uh, I think I saw some comments in the chat box. Tracy, should we take a, a break here for questions? on either sure. of these first two topics? Yeah, so uh, we got a question on the Samus property from Janet. So since the property, the, I'm sorry, since the person owning the Samus house that wants to demolish filed for a permit before everyone trying to form the district, what will happen to the house? He did not file a permit to demolish the house. He only filed 
uh, subdivision application, which has since been modified uh, from a three lot subdivision to a two lot subdivision. So he is uh, at this point proposing to keep the house and promising to keep it for five years. And that's just his individual promise. If it becomes a historic district, then it's a different uh, situation. Uh, and he would not be able to demolish it even after five years. Uh, and it should be noted, it's a legal two-family house. So if he does uh, secure the subdivision to build a new house in the back, there will still be three families on that property, um, which, you know, may be a compromise. It's not what it was originally where it was one family, uh, but, you know, he does have the right to keep it as a two-family and then the question is up to the planning board whether he can make it uh, a two-family. Historic designation does not preclude in and of itself subdivision of property. There are several you know, historically designated houses on large lots that over the years have been subdivided. The Preservation Commission gets review over the new houses that are built on those new lots, um, but uh, it doesn't stop the subdivision. There may be other means available to the planning board to uh, not approve a subdivision, but that's beyond the scope of the historic designation. And I should also point out, once a petition for um, designation is filed, there's a moratorium on approvals from various boards uh, and departments in town hall. So even though the subdivision application has been submitted prior to the petition, now that the petition is on file, the planning board cannot approve that subdivision. They can continue to review it, but they just can't do the review. The approval, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. And then I haven't seen any questions about the Crippen house um, come through. Megan, who no longer lives in Huntington, just mentioned that she remembers the house. So it's been. Uh, uh, Kip Crip Carpen. Kip Carmen, who I mentioned, was a musician. He was you know, rather well known, I think, in the 70s and 80s in town. Um, and if you go to his uh, website, kipcarmen.com, you can hear some of his music. And I, I think it's actually quite good. That's kipcarmen.com? Yes. Hmm, okay. Two A's in Carmen. Ah. All right, that's all we have for questions so far. So we can soldier on. Now let's go to the Marion Carl Farm. This is a, a property that comes up from time to time. It has an interesting background. Uh, it, the farm goes back to the seven, about, I think, 1701. The Carl family established a farm, a large farm of uh, about a thousand acres and spreading across from Colmack into Dix Hills and since been subdivided among different family members over the centuries. Uh, the most recent uh, piece that we are interested in and that I'm going to talk about today is the nine acres that it remains from the John Carl farm that was inherited by his daughter, or I guess not daughter, great granddaughter or great granddaughter, Marion Carl. Um, the farmhouse was built in 1860s, and I'll show you some pictures of that in a, in a bit. Um, Marion Carl lived there. She was very active in the Comac schools. In fact, one of the schools in Comac was called the Marion Carl School. Uh, she left her will, and in her will, she left the farm to the Comac School District with the condition that it remain a farm, it, the, the name Marion Carl be associated with it, that it be used for historical and farming education, a historic site with farming. Uh, the school district, when, after she died in 1969, was a little at a loss to figure out what to do with this property. Uh, it had animals, it had a life tenant, uh, Marion's niece, uh, Alberta Jenkins, lived on the property. So here they had a farm with people and animals, and they didn't quite know what to do uh, as a school district with this property. Eventually, they brought in BOCES to run programs there. And from what I understand, they were very successful programs. BOCES applied for state grants to restore the barns, um, but they never did anything with the house. The house, as you can imagine, was left as a time capsule. Uh, because, uh, you know, Marion Carl died there, her, her aunt, her niece died there, and all their belonging, clothing, books, newspapers were left behind. The BOCES program eventually ended uh, about 20 years ago, and the school district looked for other things to do with this property, 
The Comac Ambulance Corps was going to locate on the front two acres of the property and they proposed the town take over the, the farm towards the rear. Uh, the town didn't really want to take on that responsibility, didn't, wasn't in a position to maintain uh, such a historic building uh, any more than the school district was. Uh, they approached the Hamlet, which is a golf course community that surrounds the Marion Carl, the nine acres of the Marion Carl farm, about uh, acquiring it. And they, uh, the Hamlet was going to acquire it and build 35 condominium units on the farm while preserving the barns and restoring the uh, farmhouse. Um, but that, that, that had to go to a vote to the residents of the school district. Uh, the Hamlet was going to pay the school district $750,000 for nine acres. And there were opposition from a couple of different uh, corners, people who wanted to maintain the farm as Mary and Carl wished opposed it. People who thought the price wasn't high enough opposed it. People who thought it could be soccer fields opposed it. And as a result, the referendum failed. The school district was stuck with this uh, property. Eventually the heirs of Mary and Carl sued the school district to recover ownership saying that they had failed to live up to Mary and Carl's uh, conditions in her will to uh, maintain it as an educational historic farm. As a result of that litigation, which lasted several years, the restrictions imposed by the will were lifted. The uh, judge determined that the heirs had waited too long to bring their claim, and the school district was now free to do whatever it liked with the farm. Um, Eventually, the school district uh, issued requests for proposals from various people to do things. There was a veterinarian who wanted to run a clinic here. There was a hard horse farm that wanted to use it for horses. Uh, there was someone who wanted to use it as a corporate retreat and grow flowers for the flower market in Manhattan and uh, as a place for people to stop on the way out to the East End. Uh, and a place where corporate events could be held under a tent. Uh, but the proposal that was selected uh, by the school district was one submitted by Long Island University, which was in the process of establishing a veterinary school. And they would use this property uh, uh, to house animals that these veterinary students would come out and minister to. There was some controversy because the property had been vastly overgrown over the years. And when LIU came in, they started to clear the property. They started to work on the barns. And some people complained and objected because they were putting new roofs on the barns. Um, when they complained to the State Historic Preservation Office, they said, what are, you, what are you complaining about? That's the exact thing they should be doing. If we want to preserve these barns, they need new roofs. Uh, I was happy to stop by the farm um, a couple of weeks ago and discover that these are the those barns that this is what they looked like uh, a few years ago. Not bad because they've been restored by BOCES, but certainly in need of paint, not necessarily well cared for. Now look like this, the property has been opened up. It looks more like a farmstead and the buildings are in very good condition. This is the inside of the cow barn, which is uh, meets the uh, requirements of the USDA, which regulates veterinary schools. Some of the old um, stalls that had neck restraints for the cows are not considered humane anymore. Uh, so those had, those had to be removed. And instead of a hard surface, there's sand for the cows to stand on uh, within the stalls. And there were cows on the property. There were about a dozen cows. They now are at a farm upstate. And unlike when you tell your children that the dog went up to a farm upstate, these cows are still very much well and alive. Um, but there are chickens and guinea hens kept on the property. There are sheep, and here are the sheep out in the fields. And this is what Marion Carl really wanted. She wanted to be a farmstead for people to come and see animals grazing in the fields. Unfortunately, the house has not been addressed yet. This is what that 1860 house looks like. The school district did put a new membrane on the roof to keep the water out, uh, but water had been getting in there for well over 20 years. Um, it's in pretty dire condition, but it is fenced off uh, from the rest of the property. This the school district retained control of, as well as the front corner of the property, 
where they're going to bring students in to plant root crops uh, and learn about farming the way Marion Curl intended. The superintendent tells me that they have plans to allocate some funds to do an exterior renovation of the house, you know, to fix up the holes, to put a real roof on, to paint the house, and at least get it secure. Then the plans are to uh, remove the contents of the house, uh, catalog them, put them in storage for safekeeping, and then room by room restore the house, eventually returning all the contents and turning it into a museum. Um, how that's going to work exactly has not been determined yet. The school district is not in the business of running museums, uh, but I suggested that perhaps they can find a nonprofit group to partner with, you know, a Friends of the Marion Carl Farm uh, group to help raise money and operate this as a, a house museum. Uh, so things are looking up. When, when things at the farm were dire, dire shape a, a few years ago, now uh, I think it's, it's on the right track, and I think Marion Carl would be pleased uh, with the direction this is taking. You may notice the red X on the house, or the white X on the red background, which is also on one of the barn buildings. Uh, that doesn't mean the building is condemned, it just means it's off limits to LIU. So this is one that the school district uh, retains ownership of. If you Google Marion Carl Farm, you may find a website uh, with someone who uh, got into the property a few years ago to help catalog take photographs to catalog the contents. And he then took some of those photographs and put them on the website and told a very dramatic story about how he discovered this abandoned house that no one knew existed. And it's a time capsule and so on and so on and so on. It's, the story is mostly true, but greatly embellished, I would say. And I think some of the photographs are, are staged and uh, not quite the way the house was or is uh, today. Uh, any questions at this point as we finish up Marion Carl? Ron had a few comments. Um, earlier on when you were talking about the original proposal, he said it was not thought out. They wanted it saved. And then he said, wow, looks like a huge improvement. LIU looks like the answer. Odd that we've heard nothing as residents in the district. Not holding his breath. <laughs> uh, that is odd. I'm surprised because the school district for once uh, is doing the right thing, and, and I would think they would want to uh, brag about that. All right, and then, maybe they've been criticized so often that they're a little gun shy. Yeah, that may be the case. Um, Regina said, as a one-time wannabe farmer, she is thrilled at the direction that is taken. And that's all we have so far for comments in the chat. I'd like to move on to cemeteries. It's another area that's not necessarily a historic preservation of no, historic preservation. It is a historic preservation issue. Cemeteries. We have 56 cemeteries throughout the town of Huntington. The biggest is the old burying ground on Main Street, uh, right behind the Soldiers and Sailors building, uh, which uh, is the final resting place of thousands of colonial era uh, Huntingtonians. But over the years, smaller family cemeteries were established throughout the town, and there are 56 of them. And one of the things that's been uh, occupying my time in the past year or so is paying more attention to the cemeteries where people of color uh, were interred. Um, obviously, there were, uh, there were hundreds of uh, people who were enslaved in the colonial period, and they're buried somewhere. Most of those early uh, enslaved peoples were probably buried in the old burying ground with the members of the household uh, that had enslaved them. Uh, but some may have been buried in other places, and certainly into the 19th century, after uh, full uh, manumission of enslaved people, they were buried in other places. And one of the locations turned out to be in Cold Spring Harbor. Uh, this was known as the Jones Cemetery. Uh, this is on Harbor Road, just south of Lawrence Hill Road. And this is what it looked like a few years ago. Uh, it had become a little bit of a dumping ground, uh, mostly landscapers dumping things uh, in the driveway and, and, and adjacent to the driveway for the neighboring house. Uh, some background of this property is that it was owned by the Hewlett and Jones families over the years, uh, going back centuries. Uh, the Hewlett's and Jones owned virtually all the land circling the head of Cold Spring Harbor. Um, and they had a couple of houses and right next door to this property is a house that is now owned by the state of New York uh, as part of the Trailview State Park property. This cemetery is surrounded by State Park property on two sides. On the third side is uh, Suffolk County Water Authority pumping station. 
and the fourth site is Harbor Road. Uh, it was known as the Jones Cemetery because it was Jones property. The Jones family deeded this property to uh, St. John's Church. Uh, and over the years, I think St. John's uh, unintentionally lost track of it. Uh, there's some question whether it really is still owned by the church or the town of Huntington, uh, but we're working cooperatively between the town and the church to, to do the right thing for this cemetery. So uh, the, the ownership question, I think, can be held in the abeyance uh, for the time being. But it came, the cemetery came back to, the, to everyone's attention when uh, a woman who is now the director of the Oyster Bay Historical Society, Denise Shepard Evans, uh, approached St. John's and said she's looking for one of her ancestors' um, final burying place. Uh, she knew it was somewhere in Cold Spring Harbor and he had been in some way associated with St. John's and, and wanted to find out where it was. The minister at the time was new. He was not aware of the cemetery. One of the church members who was a former assistant town attorney asked me if there could be such a place in Cold Spring Harbor where uh, people of color had been buried. And I said, well, yes, that sounds like the Jones Cemetery. Uh, so we, we came out to see it and found it in this condition, which is really unfortunate. And there you can see right across the pond is St. John's Church. Uh, and this is what the cemetery looked like. There was even a jet ski uh, in the driveway, abandoned there in the driveway. Uh, so people find places that are publicly owned that they can use as dumps, unfortunately. So St. John's, uh, Gideon Pollock is the, uh, the rector. Uh, the curate is on this call, Mary Beth. Uh, they got together a bunch of volunteers to do a major cleanup of this site. We also worked with some um, uh, actually young people of color who were uh, employed through the Suffolk County Department of Labor uh, to do summer work throughout town for various projects. And they worked here for a couple of weeks, uh, removing vines and cutting saplings and, and helping to clear the land. And this is a, a big community cleanup day uh, to remove the leaves uh, a couple of falls ago, uh, ago before uh, COVID hit. Uh, and as you can see, we now have a fence uh, around the cemetery, so it's pretty clear what the extent of it is. And we've also decided to rename it the Harbor Road Burying Ground. Uh, the Jones family gets enough notoriety uh, on their own, right? They don't need to take credit for this cemetery. And uh, it's kind of a, a misnomer because no one named Jones uh, is buried here. The only people whose names we know of for sure that are buried here are Alfred Thorne, who died in 1900. He was a coachman for the Jones family, and his mother, Patience, who died in 1872. Um, for a long time, it was hard to read the dates on, and the year on her stone to figure out if she was Alfred's sister or mother, but I've since found a newspaper reference that uh, indicates she was indeed his mother. Most of the other uh, Graves on this property are marked with field stones. Uh, as you can see here in the distance, if they show up, these are just simple field stones set upright to mark graves. I have counted about three dozen of them, but we haven't done a systematic mapping of those locations. The numbers may be greater. Uh, and in fact, there's probably room here for a couple of hundred burials if uh, it is filled to capacity. Now, why there was a uh, a burying ground for people of color in Cold Spring Harbor may seem strange today when you consider the uh, makeup of the community. But in the 19th century, there was a significant community uh, of people of color further south on Harbor Road near the Upper Mill Dam and the Upper Mill, including Peter Crippen. Uh, he lived uh, down the street from here. And there is a possibility, because I, I think one of his uh, relatives or children is buried here, that Peter Crippen is buried in this uh, cemetery as well. Uh, we don't really know for sure, but he may be. You know, for a couple of years, that committee that I mentioned uh, of the church and the town working together to explore this uh, has been trying to figure out what to do, how we can identify who are the people who are buried here and give them the notice and recognition uh, that they deserve, that people who have marked graves uh, already enjoy. And uh, we have some people searching newspaper records, doing genealogy research, and I also went to the town archives and found the death records. And in the death records, it lists people. It indicates if they are uh, white, African, black, uh, colored, people of color. Those are the different terms they used in the 19th century. And it indicates where they are buried. So I identified uh, 18 people 
who are people of color who were buried in Cold Spring Harbor. And this is uh, one of two cemeteries in Cold Spring Harbor that are possible. The other one is Heritage Hill, uh, further north uh, uh, above the village. And that is more of a family cemetery. Uh, so it is, seems pretty clear to me that those 18 people are buried here. And as I said, one of them is a Crippen, and it may be well be that Peter Crippen uh, and his wife and other children are buried here as well. Uh, later generations of the Crippen family are buried in the Huntington Rural Cemetery. So it's, it's interesting that we'd be able to identify some of these people and, and give them uh, the notice that they really deserve. This is one of those fieldstone markers. Most of them are blank, but this one actually has initials carved in, and it looks like a date that I can't quite make out, uh, but it looks like MW are the, are the initials. Uh, this is what the cemetery looks like today. All that uh, trash has been removed, the leaves have been removed. We haven't removed leaves yet this year. That still needs to be done. And we put this sign up that's posted there. So let the people know that this is a historic burying ground, who is buried here. And uh, we want people to, to be cautious as they come through. And if they have any information, because there are descendants who still uh, are coming by and trying to find their ancestors' final resting place, we ask that they contact me so we can record those uh, recollections and uh, the indication of who some of the other people beyond the uh, nine to 20 names that we have, uh, who they are. Another cemetery, which is most, very most likely uh, the final resting place of enslaved people is, on, is in Lloyd Neck on the grounds of Comset uh, State Historic Park, which of course uh, was part of the Lloyd family holdings uh, dating to the 17th century. Uh, Henry Lloyd was the first of the Lloyds to come to Lloyd Neck and built a house, uh, which is uh, the Henry Lloyd house uh, at the entrance to the horse barns um, at Comset. Uh, that's where they drive in, everyone else drives into the service entrance. Uh, Marshall Field, who created Comset in the 1920s, used the Henry Lloyd house as his gatehouse. And just to the east of that property uh, was, there are two cemeteries, there's one of tenant farmers who lived on the neck of the 19th century. And then there was one we called the uh, schoolhouse cemetery because it was next to the old Lloyd Neck schoolhouse. And we kind of, there was indications that there was a cemetery there, but no one had ever researched it completely, uh, except for a gentleman named John Monahan from the, uh, from BOCES, who ran environmental uh, programs at Comset. Uh, over the years, and he tried to get somebody to take attention, take notice of this cemetery and, and do something about it. He had an uphill battle for many years. Uh, Preservation Long Island, which owns the Joseph Lloyd House, which is Henry Lloyd's son, uh, which is where Jupiter Hammond, the first African-American published poet lived, uh, has uh, initiated the Jupiter Hammond Project, where they're going to reinterpret their property to give more attention to the significant contributions of Jupiter Hammond and the other enslaved people uh, of the Lloyd family. So I was with Sarah Kautz, who's the preservation advocate for Preservation Long Island, to show her the cemetery and to look through. We also knew that there was a, a family vault for the Lloyd family that had been built in the 18th century, had a large uh, marble tablet that listed the names of the a dozen or so people who were buried within the vault um, that was on this property somewhere. In 1912, after the last of the Lloyds uh, sold the last of their property on the neck, the uh, remains of the earlier generation of Lloyds were moved to the Huntington Rural Cemetery along with that seven foot long marble tablet. As we walked through the woods, uh, Sarah, who is an archeologist by training, noticed this area uh, and it's hard to see in this photograph, but you see some, some stones and some bricks, and there's a bit of a depression. And her surmise, and I think is probably correct, is this is probably the remains of the vault. This is where they removed the Lloyd family members from uh, and then collapsed the vault because it, it was no longer needed. But beyond, beyond that vault uh, were some other fieldstone markers and some large um, sandstone Ta uh, tablet fragments that I will show you later on. This is what the cemetery looked like earlier this year. Uh, as you can see, it's, it's fairly overgrown, lots of downed trees. Here's a fieldstone marker. Here are these uh, 
sandstone tablets that I mentioned. Uh, here's a close-up view of those. Here it is again, overgrown. And here it is after I, I spent a, a few uh, mornings clearing the property and raking it, cutting back some of the vines before they grew in for the season. And you can see it's, it's open now. You can get a better sense of what's here. And you can see these tablets. These are at least two different sandstone tablets because there's different profiles uh, to the edges. There are some engravings on them, uh, but I suspect that they were either um, engravings that were made as practice or a mistake and then recycled for other use. And the most prominent person who would have been buried here as an enslaved person would have been Jupiter Hammond. So these uh, stone tablets may mark his final resting place. Yeah, we are unsure at this point if that is the case, but that is our working theory. Uh, this is another view with some more of these fieldstone markers. In correspondence with the folks at the Comset Foundation, I discovered that there was uh, some real estate transactions between Marshall Field and uh, members of the Lloyd family, uh, the, the Derbys and, uh, and perhaps the Aldens who were Lloyd family descendants. And the correspondence refers to deeds from 1908 and uh, the 1920s and 1934. And all indications are that those deeds will give the dimensions of the cemetery. So we will be able to determine exactly how far into the woods it extends. There's at least one surveyor's monument that I have discovered that we can use as a starting point. Unfortunately, those deeds are all out in Riverhead and because of COVID, the records room is closed so I can't go out there and retrieve them. But once we do, we will be able to figure out the full extent of this cemetery uh, and then hopefully put a fence up and some signage and give it the attention and respect it deserves. I mentioned the old burying ground earlier uh, as a place where um, enslaved people uh, were most likely buried along with members of the household that enslaved them. After manumission in the 19th century, the uh, African-American people who were buried here were set off in the far corner of the cemetery, the southeast corner. And as you can see, that corner has gotten a little overgrown. Um, there is a couple of uh, marble markers here. One of them is uh, Nelson Smith, who I mentioned before, who's Peter Crippen's neighbor and one of the founders of uh, Bethel AME Church. His uh, first wife was buried here, uh, Phoebe. And then we recently discovered that his second wife is also buried here. And she is probably the last person of color interred in this cemetery. She was originally buried in Yapank, which indicates that she may have been a resident of the almshouse there. Uh, or the poorhouse, uh, but then she was moved here because that was her final wish to be buried uh, with Nelson. Uh, working with the members of the Masonic Lodge to clean up the cemetery, one of the areas we addressed was this corner. So we cleared back the ivy and the vines and the wisteria and raked it out. And now those uh, gravestones are more visible, uh, but there's still more work to be done uh, in this corner, but at least it's moving in the right direction. Any questions at this point, Tracy? Yes, we do. Um, going back to the Jones Cemetery, Janet asked, what are they going to do with the house near the Jones Cemetery? Yeah, there's actually uh, two houses that the state of New York owns. The original plan in the early 1960s when the state acquired Comset uh, and to turn it into a park, they were gonna make it a very active park with golf courses and uh, a swimming beach, and I think you, I'm not sure about a marina, maybe, probably not a marina, but it would be a little bit like a Sunken Meadow State Park. And to get people up there, all the people who would use all these activities, they were going to build a parkway that was an extension of the existing Bethpage State Parkway, which now ends at Bethpage State Park. So they condemned land all along from Bethpage State Park up through uh, Woodbury, Cold Spring Harbor, and Lloyd Harbor uh, to build this parkway. Uh, it would have run right next to the uh, Harbor Road burying ground. And in acquiring all that land, they acquired, uh, I guess, at least three houses, actually four houses. Uh, two of them are, are on Harbor Road, south of the burying ground. And the state had been renting them out for a number of years. Uh, but uh, and, and at one point, the Coastman Harbor Labs 
was making use of the White House next to the burying ground. Uh, but now they've been vacant for a number of years. I, every time I see the regional director of state parks, and I'm now working on my second regional director, I ask them to try to do something to fix them up, you know, make them, there's a program called resident curators where people can live in a house rent free on condition that they bear all the expense of fixing it up. Uh, they're interested in doing something like that, but they need state legislation to authorize it. So the state is aware. Uh, the regional director, Chip Gorman, said that he put in a request in this year's budget to put some money towards restoring those houses. Um, I, I don't know if that did make it into the budget, uh, but unfortunately those houses are, are not doing well when they're vacant, uh, as we saw with the Peter Crippen house. Uh, the two other houses that the state owns, one of them was owned actually by a family of color, the Seaman family, on the north side of Lawrence Hill Road. Um, although they lived next to the burying ground, right across the street, it seems none of those family members were buried there. Uh, I found the, their obituaries noticed that they were buried uh, either in Westbury or uh, St. John's Memorial Cemetery in Laurel Hollow. That house uh, was given to the family as long as uh, members, a uh, certain member of the family lived. So she basically had a life estate. When she got older uh, and was in ill health, she went to live with her daughter in Hempstead. So the house was vacant by the time the, the state took ownership uh, and it was demolished. The foundation is still there, but the house is gone. And the fourth house that the state acquired is the Red House between Harbor Mist Restaurant and the entrance to Cold Spring Harbor a Library. Uh, that had a tenant until recently, uh, but he passed away. I'm not sure what the state's plans are for that, uh, that property. I assume they're gonna rent it out again. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, Mary Beth had just mentioned that she works at the church and the houses don't belong to them. She thought perhaps they were owned by the town, but you've cleared that up for us. Uh, that's all for questions so far. Great. Now, another project that uh, uh, had generated some controversy over the years is Old Town Hall. Um, this is what it looked like a, a couple of years ago. Old Town Hall was not called Old Town Hall when it was built. It was just called Town Hall. It was built in 1910. Uh, the clock on top was donated by Cornelia Prime, who also donated the trade school. Huntington Hospital was one of Huntington's biggest philanthropists. And the town uh, remained in this building until uh, 1979, when it moved to the old high school, which is now known as Town Hall. The wood structure, actually here it's vinyl sided, uh, to the right uh, predates Old Town Hall. This was a store, at one point there was a bowling alley behind it. Um, it had a storefront. It looked much different originally. It was later used uh, when town uh, government was here uh, for the Huntington Police Department. And they had a jail uh, downstairs. Uh, but in later years, uh, after the town moved out, this uh, old town hall was used as an office building by an insurance company. Then it was a real estate brokerage office. The annex, as it came to be known, was rented out to lawyers. Um, and then uh, it was finally sold to a local investor who came up with the idea of converting it into a hotel. Uh, he would build an addition in the back where the parking lot is and the old town hall section would be used uh, as the lobby and uh, the bar area up in the old town uh, justice of the peace uh, room on the second floor. Um, that proposal dates back close to 20 years or oh, more than 15 years. Uh, there were issues that arose over the years. They had to secure all sorts of variances for parking. They had to secure approvals from the Preservation Commission, uh, which they did, uh, approvals from the town board. Uh, and then the uh, financial crisis of 2008 really put a, a damper in their plans. Uh, some of the investors had passed away. It was hard to secure financing. So the, the project sort of sat uh, moldering uh, and not progressing at all. Uh, there was also a question, a problem with an old gas tank that had not been properly abandoned. So, so there, were, there were some environmental concerns as well. Uh, that developer sold it to uh, someone who had more hotel experience, runs hotels throughout the country. Uh, and he decided to expand the plans uh, from a 54 room hotel to an 80 room hotel, which required demolishing this building which as you can see, it has been demolished. Uh, construction has now started. Um, and the building would be a lot bigger and there was some concern that we had lost this old wooden structure. Um, the Preservation Commission 
took that into consideration. They looked at it. They, they did not want to lose it, but the building has lost a lot of its original character. The original storefront uh, was greatly altered over the years. Uh, it was actually the first floor of that building that had a brick face when the police department was there, and now it had vinyl siding. It was in poor condition, and the thought was that the more important structure was Old Town Hall. And Old Town Hall had been sitting empty for too many years. And if this is what was required to make the project economically viable and to proceed and have Old Town Hall be restored, it was the price they were willing to pay. So the Preservation Commission signed off on demolition of that annex building. Uh, and now uh, construction, as you can see, is well underway. The elevator shafts are in place. Um, the, the floor, the first floor has uh, been poured and now the uh, wooden structure of the next floor and the upper floors uh, are going up. When I say the first floor, this is the first floor on the main street level. Uh, in the back, the parking lot will remain. So the parking will be under the building. This is what that um, street view will look like when it's done. Old Town Hall will be restored. This is an architectural rendering, so he doesn't have all the details. There'll be a glass separator between Old Town Hall and the new uh, hotel building. Um, this was the plan that was approved by the Preservation Commission. The town board, when they looked at it, was not thrilled with the material. And I'll have a picture later on to show you how it's going to look with brick. But I wanted to show you, this is the original uh, boutique hotel plan submitted by the first um, investor who wanted to build this project. And this is the addition. And the new plan pretty much calls for the same massing. It's just going to have different uh, siding on it. Uh, again, the glass separator was something that I suggested early on so that it's clear where Old Town Hall stops and the new construction begins. Uh, this is that view as it is today in progress. And this is the plan, the section of that plan that I showed you earlier with the facade treatment approved by the town board. The town board decided they would prefer bricks. Originally, we were trying to shy away from bricks so that we did not mimic Old Town Hall. With a historic preservation project where you have an addition, you don't want to mimic the existing building. You want to show a clear delineation between the old and the new. You want to complement it, but not mimic it. And we think this uh, design does that. The, um, as you can see here, it's a little hard because it's small. The columns had been deteriorating, but they've been fixing them up with epoxy and they will be repainted. The trim, most of which had been rotted away, has been replaced. And they are restoring currently uh, the clock tower. I took this picture, I think, two days ago. Uh, so work is ongoing and uh, hopefully this will be open and ready uh, for business next year. Um, the, the owner is very interested in the historic building uh, and is, is doing you know, all that he can to restore it. He's working with the Huntington Historical Society to get photographs of historic Huntington sites uh, to decorate the inside. So all in all, this should be a, a real plus uh, for the town of Huntington. There are concerns with you know, overdevelopment and traffic and parking, uh, but I think the town deserves a hotel uh, and this will be a nice addition to meet that unmet need. Any questions on the hotel? Nothing yet. You said you it's supposed to be completed next year, as in 2022? Yes. Oh, great. So that is really the coming along. They're moving right along. Yeah, that's uh, the, the, uh, the exterior envelope, I'm sure, will be done uh, in a couple of months. But then it's the, all the interior work always takes longer than you think. Another property that we got lots of questions about is the Booker T. Washington House in uh, uh, the Fort Salonga area. Booker T. Washington uh, was the uh, founding president of Tuskegee Institute in, in Alabama. He would come up to Long Island to, uh, in the summers to do fundraising because this is where the money was. And he relied on a lot of generous donors to keep uh, Tuskegee in business. He rented um, the old Van Wyck house in uh, Lloyd Harbor for a number of years. 
Uh, and then finally in 1911, he purchased property uh, in Fort Salonga. He did not purchase it directly. Uh, he went through several uh, straw men to hide his identity uh, from the neighbors. And once the neighbors found out, they were very upset. They tried to buy him out for more money than he paid, but he held on to the property. There was some concern that he would build uh, Tuskegee North um, in Fort Salonga, but that was never his intention. This was just a place for him to come up in the summers. As soon as the school year was, was over, he, his secretary and family, would uh, pack up uh, and come here and, and do uh, their fundraising uh, here. And why he came to Huntington, I think, is because one of the members of his uh, board of trustees was the president of the Southern Railroad, who was also the president of the Long Island Railroad, who had property in uh, Huntington Bay. So I think that's probably the connection to Huntington and, and why he came here. The house sits on a bluff high over looking uh, the Long Island Sound next to the golf course of Indian Hills Country Club. Um, and the front of the house faces the water. So this is what you would have seen in, in 2002. This is what you see today. As you can see, it's getting kind of overgrown. Uh, and this is the, the view from the street. Uh, it's really just the back of the house. Um, there was a gentleman who wanted to uh, do some restoration work to the house. It has been designated as a local landmark. Uh, but he uh, did not pursue that project and he sold it to someone else. The new owner um, applied to revoke the historic designation so that he could demolish the house, but the town board said there's no way we're revoking this historic designation. Rethink your plans. So he has come up with a new plan to take the historic Booker T. Washington house, this is it, move it, flip it around so it faces the street, move it closer to the street, uh, this will be the view from the back and the sides. Here's the back, here are the sides. And then behind it, he would build this large house. Here's the Booker T. Washington house. They're connected by a lower level uh, walkway uh, with a garage under the Booker T. Washington house. And here's his large house that is going to be closer to the bluff. The Booker T. Washington house has been moved at least once, maybe twice, away from the bluff. The bluff is getting closer and closer to the house. And if he wants to move the house out of danger, closer to the street and put his new house in the danger zone, I think that's fine. That's a good thing for this house. It will be a wonderful way to preserve the house. People always ask, can we move it to another location? Uh, can we turn it into a museum? That's theoretically possible, but it's privately owned. Um, and moving a house, as I mentioned before, is not always a good idea because houses should maintain their context. And if it's, uh, if it's moved, it loses that context. Uh, and uh, turning it into a museum is a very difficult undertaking because uh, it takes, it's going to take a lot of money just to restore the house, to staff it, to furnish it, and to maintain it. And that, I think, is um, too big an undertaking, especially in this location, well off the beaten trail. I don't think it would get too many visitors. So this is a project that has now secured all its approvals from uh, the Preservation Commission, the Town Board, and the Zoning Board of Appeals, and it should be moving forward. I've reached out to the architect to find out when they're going to start. Uh, I've been expecting them to start for any time now for the last several years, uh, and, and I hope it will be sometime later this year. Any questions on that before we get to our last topic? Yes, from Megan. Who was the president of LIRR at that time? Ooh, good trivia question. His name was Baldwin. Can't remember his first name, but it was Baldwin. Baldwin, okay. Uh, finally, I want to talk about the John and Alice Coltrane home. Some people had asked about that. Uh, this is what the house looked like uh, in 2004. Uh, John Coltrane, uh, as uh, some of you may know, is considered one of the greatest jazz musicians, actually greatest musicians of the 20th century. He was a real innovator. He composed A Love Supreme in this house in 1964, shortly after he purchased it. And many consider that to be one of the greatest uh, musical compositions of the 20th century. Uh, people still study it and discuss it and, and try to uh, make sense of it. Um, his wife was also a musician, uh, played with him. Uh, and after he died in 1967 at Huntington Hospital, she continued to uh, create music, compose music. She built a recording studio in the basement of this house and recorded uh, several albums here. Um, and she stayed here until 1972 when she and her children moved to California. 
The house then had subsequent owners over the years, uh, but very little was changed inside the house. Uh, it was finally acquired by a developer in the early 2000s, and it sits on three acres. So the developer wanted to demolish the house and subdivide the property. And at the time, uh, the connection of the house to John Coltrane and Alice Coltrane had kind of been lost. But there's a, a resident of Dix Hills, uh, Steve Fogoni, who's a big Coltrane fan. He was a member of uh, what was then the newly formed Half Hollow Historical Association, and they asked him to be the historian. And he thought, well, one of the things I can do is discover this connection to John Coltrane, because people knew John Coltrane lived in Dix Hills, but it was not well known where he lived. Steve did some research, uh, found an interview with someone who used to work uh, as a delivery person for a pharmacy, and uh, found out this is where he lived. He saw the, the, uh, the real estate developer sign on the property and realized that you know, its, its days were probably numbered. He mobilized uh, not only the local community, but a worldwide musical community to save this house. Uh, people were at the town board meeting, a packed town board room. Uh, people were singing and making pleas that uh, you know, we should save this house. And the town board did designate it as a local uh, historic landmark, which protected it from demolition. And then shortly thereafter, the town uh, acquired the property and created on this three acre site Coltrane Park and deeded the house itself to a new nonprofit called Friends of the Coltrane Home. Uh, the house has been, the property has been cleared. Uh, the house has been uh, stabilized. There's a lot of work that needed to be done. It's been vacant for uh, over two decades. Uh, there was a horrible mold infiltration problem in the house. Uh, so the, the Friends uh, group uh, had uh, the mold remediated over the years. They secured a grant from the 1772 Foundation to replace the roof, put new soffits, rebuild the chimney. Uh, they cleared out all the debris, put plexiglass over the windows to secure the building. Um, and it is, is it in a secure position now, but still progress was slow. In 2011, the National Trust, which had had the Coltrane House on its radar, for a number of years, declared it one of the 11 most endangered historic sites in America. That generated some publicity, uh, some donations, some more further work could be done uh, to continue stabilizing the house. And a couple of years ago, the National Trust declared the property a national treasure, um, which opened up even more grant opportunities. The National Trust has worked very closely with the Coltrane Home, or I should say the Coltrane Home has worked very closely with the National Trust uh, to advance this project, um, a business plan for restoration of the house and future programming has been developed. Um, a very prominent engineering firm in New York City, Thornton Tomasetti, who usually work on uh, skyscrapers and, and highway projects, has taken this on as a pro bono project to um, uh, figure out how to restore the crumbling brick facade, which is uh, cr cracked in, in several locations to shore up the, uh, the structure so that it meets museum standards. Uh, they're gonna start working with Mass Design, which is an architectural firm in Boston, which works on projects with, which have a social justice component. Um, and the uh, group is in the process of applying for grants uh, and has received grants from the, the uh, African-American Cultural Action Heritage Fund. Now that's Cultural Heritage Action Fund, which is a project of the National Trust for Historic Preservation to uh, give more support to important African-American sites. So this is something that is now receiving national and, and indeed international attention right in our own backyard. And I think great things are in store for this property. We've been working also with the local community, um, a, a prominent architecture, a landscape design firm, a Nelson Bird and Wolfs has prepared a landscape plan for the park that surrounds the home, which is town property. So that'll be uh, up to the town to implement. And it will feature uh, a winding path through the backyard, which is wooded and will have clearings for meditation and uh, you know, different small scale programs, a place for people to come and enjoy and contemplate. Uh, and eventually the house will be opened and will be restored to its 1960s appearance. The recording studio will be restored and hopefully a place where uh, people can do recording. Uh, for the most part, we hope to reach out to students, local students who can come and, and be part of this legacy of the Coltrane home and continue 
uh, John and Alice's uh, legacy of innovation in, in music uh, and advancing social justice calls and spirituality. And, and there's a lot behind the Coltrane home more than just being a house museum. Uh, I see it as a place where people can come, sit on the furniture. It's not a house museum where you can't touch. We don't want a no touch museum. We want an interactive experience and a, and a house filled with music and creativity. Uh, and that I, I hope will be coming very soon. Uh, it's been a long time in the, in the making, but one thing I've learned in 19 years as town historian, good things come to those who wait. So any questions on the Coltrane home or any other of the topics that I, I covered? Thank you so much, Robert. I have not seen anything further come through. We'll give it another minute or so and see if, if there are any further questions. That was excellent. That was such a helpful overview. I know there's a lot of questions and misinformation, especially on Facebook. So this is really helpful to have all that information. Explained. Yes, that's what I hope is that, you know, people do ask about these from time to time and it's hard to, to find a good forum uh, for providing uh, timely updates. Uh, so hopefully that serves, this serves that purpose. Thank you. All right, well, I guess if there aren't any other questions, Regina says terrific uh, presentation. Thanks so much. Um, here we go, Janet, how large is the Booker T. Washington property? Uh, I think it's two acres, but a lot of it is um, a bluff that has been falling away into the Long Island Sound. So the actual flat, grassy part of the property is, I would say less than an acre. Yeah. Okay. All right, and then just some good feedback. Um, Lillian says, absolutely fascinating. Megan, thank you so much for all this information. Much appreciated. Allison says, thank you. Thrilled to hear about the hotel. There are so few places to stay in the area. So true. All right, uh, Janet says thanks for another informative session. Well, thank you everyone so much for joining us. I know that it's hard to stay inside now that the weather has turned so lovely, but we are thrilled that you stayed. And as I said, I'm gonna send you the link to this video and some event information in the email and hopefully we'll see you next time. Thank you all, thank you, Robert. You're welcome, thank you very much. Have a great afternoon.